Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, if you would do so. We're in Luke chapter 10 this morning. Luke chapter 10. And if you would locate verse 25, that's where we'll pick up this morning. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And we'll be considering this morning the subject of inheriting eternal life. Inheriting eternal life. There were a father and a a son who were taking a walk one day. And during the walk, the boy asked his dad, he said, Dad, how can electricity go through the wires between those poles? Well, the dad said, I don't know, son. I never learned much about electricity. They went on a little bit further, and the boy stopped and said, Dad, what, what causes thunder and lightning? And the dad said, you know, I've never really thought about that. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> well, all through the walk, they kept stopping, and the boy kept asking questions. And every time he'd ask a question, the dad would come back with, I don't know. I don't know. Well, they got to the end of the walk and returned home, and the boy said, Dad, I hope you didn't mind me asking all those questions. And the dad said, well, not at all, son. How else are you going to learn? You know, questions are important, aren't they? Questions are important, but just as important as the questions are, so are the answers. Uh, this morning, we're going to consider a very important question, perhaps the most important question. And Jesus will give an answer to this question, which, which uh, will give an answer about eternal life. And so I want us to consider that this morning. Look at verse 25, and as we think about the question and the subject of eternal life, where our attention is drawn to the law and the prerequisites of the law. Verse 25, we read, and behold, there was a certain lawyer who stood up and tested Jesus and said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Did you catch the question there? There it is. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 25 begins with the word behold, and that's, that's a term of amazement. This passage, this encounter is truly an amazing one. And we notice that this passage is about an encounter between a certain man who is described for us as a lawyer. He was in that crowd that day. You remember that Jesus had been speaking to his disciples, and there was a crowd, and in that crowd was this man. The word lawyer is from the Greek word that means law. He was an expert in the law. He was part of one of those religious groups called the scribes, another, another name for the lawyers. There were three groups of religious leaders. There was the Sadducees, the priests, there were the Pharisees, and then there were the lawyers or the scribes. His specialty was the law. He was an expert in the Jewish law. He had studied God's law. He was an expert in interpreting the law and then giving application of God's law to daily life. Notice in, in this encounter, we see an exchange of observations and thoughts between Someone who is, quote unquote, an expert in the word with the one who is the word. And notice the amazing encounter that takes place. This scribe had been listening to Jesus speak to his disciples. And in verse 25, we see that he stood up and he tested Jesus. Now, the word tested can can be interpreted in, in a couple of different ways. One is positive and, and the other is negative. The word test can mean to tempt. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they were famous for tempting Jesus, for testing him. They, they were always looking for a way to trap Jesus in his words. They would test him with his words. Now, the word test can also mean to prove or it can, it can mean to 
to draw out an answer. So perhaps this scribe was genuinely looking for an answer, that, that he was genuinely bothered by this question that was on his mind, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so he stood up and he asked Jesus because he was looking for an answer. He believed deep down that perhaps Jesus had the answer. Notice that in verse 25, the scribe addresses Jesus respectfully as teacher. It's interesting he doesn't call him Lord. He does not acknowledge Jesus as Lord. He does not acknowledge to Jesus or to others that Jesus is God or that he is sovereign, that he has power and authority. He recognizes Jesus simply as a teacher, one who would maybe have the answer to his question. So he gets right down to the question. Verse 25, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there are three basic thoughts concerning what happens after death. There are those who believe that nothing happens after death, that you simply just cease to exist. These would be the ones who are called the annihilationists. They believe that you're here and then you're gone. Nothing happens afterwards. The atheists, the agnostics, the, the intellectuals of our day, many of them believe this. People like Steve Jobs, uh, Stephen Hawking, reportedly the smartest man on earth. Steve Jobs and Stephen Hawking, they know the truth now. There are those who believe you come back as something else. These would be the reincarnationists. That this is the idea of karma. You all heard about karma, haven't you? You know, that, that if, you, if you do really good, if you live a really good life, you'll come back as something better. But if you live a really bad life, you'll come back as something worse. So like you might be a really bad person and then you'll come back as like a bug or a fly or something. You know, eventually you reach what people who believe in this, you reach, reach this highest level of, of perfection and you're kind of absorbed into the, into the perfect energy of the universe. These would be the Hindus and the Buddhists and many of the Far Eastern religions. The people that practice those religions believe in reincarnation. And then there are those who believe in life after death. That life continues after death in a place either called heaven or a place called hell. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, many cults believe in the afterlife. And the question is, well, where? And the question is, how? Where will you spend eternity, and how can you be sure? Judaism, Islam, and cults, they all attach good works with one's eternal destiny. Hence the scribe's question here, what must I do to inherit or to obtain eternal life? You know, it's ironic to me, maybe to you as well, that this scribe who was an expert, who prided himself on knowing and keeping God's law, would ask the question about what he had to do to obtain eternal life. Maybe this is what bothered him. You know, maybe he was trained in the law, but he really didn't know or he really wasn't sure about everything that he had learned. This man was bothered by his conscience or perhaps he was bothered by a, a, an empty heart. Any of you ever bothered by your conscience? Any of you ever experienced that time or that place in your life where there was a hole in your heart or a hole in your life and and it was like everything that you tried to do, everything that you tried to achieve, everything that you tried to buy or obtain, you thought, that's going to fill that hole up. That's going to be what satisfies me. That's going to be what makes me happy, only to learn that it really doesn't. This man was bothered. You know, many of those kind of misunderstandings are, are prevalent in our society today. Uh, they are prevalent in, in our world today. For instance, when you ask somebody, are you going to heaven? The response in many cases is, well, I hope so. Or, I'm a good person. 
I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. I've tried to treat others fair and right. And the response to that would be, but have you done enough good things? And how do you know? How do you know that you've done enough good things to know that you've made it into heaven? What if, there's, what if you were one good deed short? You know, what, what if you were one bad deed too many? How do you know? The scribe's or this lawyer's mistake was in associating doing with receiving. What must I do to receive eternal life? Many today make that same mistake. They associate receiving eternal life with doing or being. Notice that Jesus answers this question and he addresses this misunderstanding. Look at verse 26 with me. The question's on the table. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? And what is your reading of it? And so the man answered and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your enemy as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Don't you just love it when you ask a question and you get a question back? You ask a question and you're looking for an answer and somebody returns it with another question. Here, Jesus, this man asks a question. Jesus gives him two questions. What is written in the law? There's the first question. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees, they accused Jesus of breaking God's law. So here, Jesus turns that back on him to affirm that Jesus was fully committed to keeping God's law. What does the law say? What is written in the law? Notice the second question. And what is your reading of it? Or how do you recite that? Or what is your interpretation of the law? Notice he doesn't ask him, what do you think? Really, you know, it doesn't matter what you think. What really matters is what God thinks. Amen. What really matters is what God says. So you can think all you want, but if your thinking is wrong, when you get to the end, you're wrong. But when you're thinking in accordance with God's word, God's truth, when you get to the end, you'll be right because you'll be in line with God and his word. Notice the scribe's response. He gives two recitations, two quotations. Verse 27, number one, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all of your mind. Here, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. This is the, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And since the Lord our God, the Lord is one, our response is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the scribe's response here. God commanded... His people to love him fully and exclusively with all that you are and have and nothing else, no one else. Love him with all your heart. That describes your attitudes, your motives, your will, your decision making. To love him with all of your soul describes your life, your character, your being. To love God with all of your strength describes loving him with your efforts and your energy and your deeds. To love God with all of your mind would mean to love him with your thoughts, your plans, your reasoning. But notice that he doesn't stop there. He says in verse 27, and love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Here he quotes from Leviticus 19 verse 18, which says, he only quotes part of this. That whole verse says this, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. Pay attention to that phrase there. The children of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here Jesus refers to these two commands back in Matthew 22 and in Mark chapter 12. And Jesus calls these the first and greatest commandment. And then he says, and there's a second one which is likened unto it. Love God God. 
and love your neighbor. The greatest command is to love God. The greatest command is to love others perfectly. Love God perfectly, love others perfectly. And then notice that Jesus affirms the answer. It was a good answer. Verse 28, Jesus said, you've answered right. You get 100. <laughs> and if you sign your name at the top of your test page, you'll get five extra points. You get a perfect score. You have answered rightly. And then notice what Jesus said, do this and you will live. Do this and you will have eternal life. That's the answer to your question. You found it. You know it. The scribe correctly identified the answer to his question, and he recognizes the connection between love and eternal life. Eternal life necessitates love. Love for God, love for others. If you want to obtain eternal life, then you must love God, and you must love others perfectly. That's the answer. The scribe seems to have clued in on this. He seems to have an idea or a grasp of this. So he understands the law. Look at verse 29 and notice how Jesus gives us a picture of love. Verse 29, but he, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? He tries to justify himself. The word justify is a word which means righteous. He tries to, in answering Jesus, demonstrate to himself, and he thinks to the Lord and whoever else is listening, that he is a righteous chap. He's a righteous fellow. This man was not making excuses. He wasn't offering explanations. He simply claimed that he was righteous. Now, at this point in the discussion, the scribe should have, been, should have concluded exactly the opposite. He should have concluded something different. He should have recognized his inability and the impossibility of loving God and loving others like Jesus just described with this high standard declared in God's word and set forth in, in God's law. But instead of confessing his shortcoming and crying out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on me, help me, notice what he does. He doubles down. He doubles down in his self-righteousness. Verse 29, notice what he says. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Notice that the scribe does not ask for any detail about what does it mean to love God. Now, why is that? Because he thought he was doing that. He, he believed that he was loving God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He believed, in other words, that he was in full compliance with the first four commandments of the ten. Loving God. Loving God with all that you are and all that you have. He wasn't worried about that. Instead, he wanted to know the identity of his neighbor. Who is my neighbor? And so he's thinking in his mind here, I'm loving God. And depending on the definition of neighbor, I might be loving my neighbor too. So he wants to know, am I in compliance with the last six commandments, which have to do with your neighbor, or do I have a problem there? Now notice in the scribe's response, we see something. Jesus gives one of the greatest stories, one of the greatest parables. It's only recorded right here in Luke's gospel. It's the parable of the good Samaritan. Look at the parable with me. Verse 30, Jesus answered, and he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, in this parable here, this parable is, is used in many settings today. It's used by religious leaders. It's used by moms and dads. It's used even by secular leaders in a secular situation to teach people about, here's what it means to be kind to your neighbor. Here's what it means to have sacrificial kindness for others. In fact, in many cultures, you've heard about the Good Samaritan Law. You know, the Good Samaritan Laws would say that if you're giving aid or you're showing 
kindness to somebody who is in need and say their property gets damaged or maybe their health or is damaged or their life is damaged is that that person can't sue you because you're lending help, you're lending aid to that one. So there are lots of moral lessons we could gain from, from this parable. We can learn a lot from the Good Samaritan, but we need to remember the context of this parable. Why did Jesus give us this parable? Well, it was in response to a question. What was the question? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? This story, this parable has to do with how you obtain eternal life. Let's read further. Verse 31. So this man, he's coming down. He's been robbed. He's been beaten up. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he came and he looked and he passed by on the other side. We see in this parable here, we, we are introduced to four men. There's a traveler, there is a priest, there's a Levite, and then we're going to see that there's a Samaritan. The story begins with a man, this man who's traveling was most likely a Jew. He was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. That would have been a trip of about 15 miles. But it was 15 very tough and difficult miles. You were traveling from Jerusalem at 3,500 feet in elevation down to Jericho, which was below sea level. And you're traveling or walking along a road that was steep, windy, treacherous, full of rocks, lined with caves and ravines. And it was in these caves and these ravines where robbers and thieves hid. They would hide in the shadows or in the holes in the ground, and they would prey on people that were traveling down this road, especially those who were traveling by themselves. This man apparently was traveling by himself, and robbers attacked him. And notice what they did. They took the man's belongings, they even stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him up severely, and they left him by the side of the road to die. And if nobody had come along to help him, that's exactly what would have happened. He would have died. But notice that there are, in this parable, two men that show up. The first one we read in verse 31 was a priest. There were a lot of priests that lived in Jericho. You see, the priests, they would serve a, a two-week term or of service up at the, up at the temple in, Jer in uh, Jerusalem. And then after their two weeks, they would travel back to their homes. Their homes were down along the, the seacoast or down there by the Dead Sea in warm weather. And so this priest was probably on his way home. Now, we would consider this priest to be a man of God. He was a servant of the Lord. He would have been one who understood the Word of God. He would have understood God's law. He would have understood the requirements from God's law to show mercy to those who were in need. But in spite of this priest's position, his knowledge, his obligation, what does he do? He chooses to cross the road and to avoid the situation. He looked the other way. He pretended like he didn't see him. He pretended like he wasn't there. He didn't know anything about it. That was what he was pretending. If I don't look, I don't have to do anything. Now, he might have had his reasons for doing that. His reasons might have even sounded good to us. But the point is that the priest knew what he was supposed to do. And he chose to do differently. He chose to ignore the man. He chose to ignore God's word and he went on his way. But notice the story continues. After the priest, along comes a Levite. Now the Levites, they were not priests, but they were ones who helped the priests. So they would do a term of service up at the temple as well. They would assist the priests in their priestly duties. Like the priest, this Levite would have been a man of God. He would have been familiar with God's law and the requirements of God's law. He would have known what he was supposed to do as well. But notice that like the priest, what does he do? He crosses the road too. He turns his head and he continues on his way, pretending like nothing was wrong, nothing was going on. So what can we conclude about the priest and the Levite? Well, we can conclude a couple of things. Number one, we can conclude they didn't love God. How do you know that? They didn't do what God said. 
What did Jesus say? If you love me, take my commandments, keep my commandments, do what I say. They weren't doing what God had said. They weren't keeping God's word. So obviously, they didn't love God. And they obviously, number two, they didn't love this man. They weren't concerned about this man. So we can say that both the priest and the Levite, were they qualified to have eternal life? Not according to their love. What did Jesus say? Do this and you will live. You want eternal life? Love God and love your neighbor perfectly. Well, they, they weren't going to make it. <laughs> they didn't love God and they didn't love their neighbor. The story continues. Look at verse 33 with me. But a certain Samaritan, <laughs> as he journeyed, he came where this man was. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and he said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So what's interesting here is that the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They had a long-standing feud with one another. The Samaritans hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They would both go out of their way to avoid each, uh, the, the other's territory, to avoid the other's presence, to avoid the other's company. Now, this Samaritan noticed that he's traveling down a road that was typically traveled by the Jews. So he's in a particularly dangerous situation. I mean, not only does he face the possibility of falling down and falling off of a cliff, going down this road, maybe being robbed by a bunch of thieves, but he's also in danger of hostility from the other Jewish travelers. But what does he do? This Samaritan comes upon this man who has been beaten up and robbed, and naturally those who are listening to the story at this point, they're thinking, he's going to cross the road too. In fact, he might kick him and beat him up even further. But boy, they were surprised. To their surprise, notice in verse 33, the Samaritan had compassion. He ached for this beat-up man who was on the verge of death. He ached down in the pit of his stomach for this man and for the situation that he was in. Notice in verse 34, what does he do? He goes to the man, bandages up his wounds. He pours oil and wine on the injuries to provide relief and to help keep an infection from setting in. And then he sets the man on his own animal, brings him to an inn, and he takes care of him. And then after he's taken care of him, he has to leave. So what does he do? He gives the innkeeper some money, specifically two denarii. That would have been enough money for this man to stay at the, the hotel there for one to two months. Can you imagine that? Man, he would have had to give up if he was staying at a Holiday Inn today, you know. <laughs> And what does he do? What does he say to the innkeeper? Take care of him. Do whatever you have to do to take care of this man. Make sure he gets well. Whatever other expenses you incur beyond these two denarii, when I come back, and I'll be back, you can trust me, I'll pay you. Basically, he gives the innkeeper a blank check. Any of you ever been given a blank check before? Whatever it costs, fill it in. I'll pay it. This is what he's saying to this innkeeper. And in spite of the inconvenience, the cost, the danger, this Samaritan gives attention to this man in need, and he takes care of him. In this parable, Jesus gives us a picture of what love looks like. This is what perfect, unconditional love for your neighbor looks like. This Samaritan, do you think he knew God's law? He probably didn't. He's unfamiliar with God's law. Would he know the, the law about loving God? Probably not. Was he loving God? Looks like it. With all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Was he loving his neighbor? Sure looks like it, doesn't it? He was taking care of him. It didn't matter what the cost was. He made a pledge that he would make sure this man got better. What was the original question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer was love God with all that you are. Love your neighbor perfectly. If you do, you'll live and then the response was well who's my neighbor this all leads up to this point of reckoning 
And the point of reckoning takes place in the next verse. Look at verse 36 with me. Jesus says, here's again another question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him? Who fell among the thieves? And he said, well, he who showed mercy. He who showed mercy on him. Notice that Jesus doesn't tell the scribe the answer to his question, who's your neighbor? He doesn't again give an answer. He asks a question. He asks the question and he says to the man here, give me your opinion. Give me your conclusion. Which one of these do you think was a neighbor? And the answer was the one who showed mercy. So what can we gain from that? Neighborliness is connected to showing mercy. But notice what Jesus' question was in verse 36. Who was a neighbor? Who was a neighbor? Notice that he didn't say, here's who your neighbor is. Who was a neighbor? Who do you think acted like a neighbor? The scribe says, well, originally, who should I consider to be my neighbor? Who is worthy to be my neighbor? Jesus said, you're responsible to be a neighbor to everyone. So we would maybe think, who is worthy to receive my love? Who is worthy for me to love as my neighbor? And Jesus would say, you are responsible to love everyone especially those who are in need, those who are unlovely, those who even hate you and are your enemies. Your responsibility is to love them. They are your neighbor. Well, again, the scribe answers rightly. Jesus, look at verse 37. He responds and says to the man, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Or in other words, now that you know, now that you know, Mr. Lawyer, go and do it. Go and do it. You know, again, the scribe should have recognized, he, he should have jumped right on it and admitted that he couldn't do it. Lord, I can't do that. That should have been his response. Lord, nobody can do that. Lord, I need your help. Please have mercy on me. And that's the point. That's the point of this conversation. That's the point of this parable. What must I do to be saved? The answer is, you've got to be perfect. What's the problem? Nobody is. You ever met a perfect person? I haven't either. There's only one who is perfect. That is the one who can save us. The Lord Jesus is perfect. And he came to save us imperfect, sinful people. The point is, I can't be perfect. That's why we need Jesus. We need Jesus to save us from our sin. There's no one who's perfect. There is no one who is good. There is no one who is righteous. No, not one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks after God. Everyone has turned aside, and together we have become unprofitable. That's what Paul would write in Romans chapter 3. But praise the Lord that God would send us his only begotten son. And he would make him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might in him become the righteousness of God. How does that happen? It's got to happen because the only way you can get into heaven is to become the righteousness of God. So it happens as you place your faith in the Lord Jesus because it's by grace that you're saved through faith in Jesus Christ and not of yourselves the gift of God. We're not saved by being good. We're not saved by good works. We're not saved by having good thoughts. We're not saved by treating your neighbor in a good way. You're not treat as good as those things might be. You're not saved that way. We are not saved by our good works. Why? So that none of us can boast about having anything to do with being saved. Being saved is God's work. It's what Jesus accomplished on the cross, that he made peace with God through the blood that he shed on his cross. And so as you cry out to him and as you trust in him and place your faith in him, that's how you become born again. If you would this morning confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you would this morning believe in your heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that he is Lord and Savior, that what he did on the cross there was necessary and was sufficient to save us from our sin,
to provide forgiveness from our sin, to rescue us from eternal death and damnation. If you would believe that this morning and place your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you shall be saved. Because whosoever cries out and calls upon the name of the Lord with faith will be saved. So the question this morning as we think about this, this story, this very familiar story, have you been saved? Do you know that you're saved? Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus? The invitation today is if you're not saved or if you're not sure if you're saved, would you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today? Would you surrender your life to Him and allow Him to be Lord of your life as well as Savior of your life? If you are saved today, then the, the uh, invitation would be for you to continue to walk faithfully with the one who has saved you to walk in righteousness and holiness and to allow God to continue to mold and to shape you into the kind of person that he saved you to be. The invitation this morning is for whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord. That's each, each one of us. It's for all of us this morning. So you're invited this morning to do what God says. If you're not, if you're not saved, would you trust him? If you are saved, would you follow him today? And whosoever will may come. Would you pray with me right now? As we come to this time of invitation this morning, the invitation, as I said, is for you, it's for me, it's for whosoever. And this time is not about your neighbor, it's not about your family member, it's not about your spouse, it's not about your children, it's about you. The invitation from God is from Him to you. So would you listen very carefully to what the Holy Spirit is saying? Would you consider this morning the truth of who Jesus is? That he is truly the Son of God. That he is truly the Savior of the world, and especially of those who would call upon and trust in him. And he can save whosoever will. Would you be willing and allow him to save you today? Would you trust him to do that? Would you cry out to him this morning? If you are saved, he's also able to, to take care of those problems, those needs in your life, would you trust him to do that as well? Would you follow him this, this day? And Lord, as we would come to this time of decision, this time of invitation, help us to be more than just good neighbors. Help us to be more than just good people. Help us today to become saved people to become cleansed people, to become forgiven people, to become a people who would faithfully follow and serve you with all that we are and all that we have. Lord, as we consider how high the bar has been set, none of us can get over it. None of us can love you perfectly in our own strength. None of us can love our neighbor like we love ourselves in our own strength. We need you. We understand what the requirement is. and We also understand the answer. Lord Jesus, you are the answer. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. And no one can come to the Father. Nobody can get into heaven. Nobody can be saved except by faith in you. And so I pray, Lord, for that one who's not saved, who's here in this room right now. Give that person an understanding and then the courage to trust you and to follow you. And help each one of us, Lord, those who are saved, those who are your children, to continue to trust you and follow you, that you are able to do in our lives exceedingly and abundantly great things, more than what we could ever ask or think or imagine. Help us to trust you and to follow you today as well. And be exalted in this place, Lord, with the decisions of our heart, the actions of our minds and our bodies, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to take your...